Good morning. I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers. Breaking news overnight. Actively investigating, New York's attorney general is now pursuing a criminal investigation into the Trump organization. Why the state's top lawyer is now joining Manhattan's district attorney in the ongoing probe. Relentless, a barrage of airstrikes and rockets as the conflict b- builds between Israel and Gaza. The widespread protests breaking out across the embattled region as global calls for a ceasefire are ignored. One on one, my conversation with the nation's leading infectious disease expert, Dr. Anthony Fauci. He'll clear the air on the CDC's controversial and a bit confusing guidance on mask wearing. And moment of clarity, Brian Houston, founder of the globally renowned megachurch Hillsong, now speaking out about its very public unraveling just months ago after being rocked by scandal. The church's efforts to make peace with the past to sustain its future. And you may have noticed that we are in boxes because this is another bi-coastal show. Good morning, Joe. Good morning. Yeah, we've swip, switched places this time, two weeks ago. So you were in L.A., now I'm in L.A. And so. now you're dealing with that tough time difference over there. So thanks for being up with us. <laughs> Glad to do it. We begin <laughs> at that breaking news of a criminal probe into the Trump organization. A spokesman for the New York Attorney General's office announced late Tuesday that it was, quote, now actively investigating the Trump organization in a criminal capacity, along with the Manhattan District Attorney. This investigation is in addition to the ongoing civil probe into the organization, which started in 2019. A representative for the Trump organization did not immediately respond to NBC News's request for comment. But in the past, the former president has called the investigations politically motivated. Let's bring in NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos to help us break down this breaking news. So, Danny, first of all, what do we know about this criminal investigation and what was the nature of the civil probe? The New York attorney general was already conducting a civil investigation into the Trump finances, uh, the Trump organization finances. And an interesting thing that many folks may not realize is that the New York attorney general, like many attorneys general, (laughs) investigates civil as well as criminal issues. For example, charitable organizations, they act as a police Uh, of charitable organizations to make sure that they're operating in their charitable capacity. They also investigate consumer protection issues as well, but they can act as a law enforcement agency. And that appears to be what they've done is pivoted or at least added to their investigation, the civil side, now a criminal component. And presumably it may be the case they're working with the Manhattan District Attorney's Office, which is already apparently conducting a criminal investigation into the Trump organization. What each agency's roles uh, roles are is not really certain at this point. Danny, if the probe is looking into whether the Trump organization inflated the value of its assets, what laws could have been broken and who could be held responsible for that? This is a classic, uh, often pretty easy to catch scheme if this is what's going on. A company will inflate its assets to secure loans for more money And then sometimes a company will deflate its assets when the tax man cometh to pay less taxes. And that's what you have to look for as an investigator. You're looking at whether or not they artificially inflated their value. Did they represent themselves to banks that they had more money than they did? And how did they do that? All right, Danny Savalos on this breaking news this morning. Thank you so much, Danny. Turning now to the Middle East, where calls for a ceasefire continue to be ignored. This morning, Israeli fighter jets are raining missiles on Gaza as militant groups launched a volley of rockets towards southern Israel. 219 Palestinians have been killed in Gaza, while Israeli casualties stand at 12. NBC's Martin Fletcher joins us now from Tel Aviv, Israel. Martin, good morning. What's the latest where you are? Are we any closer to a ceasefire? Uh, Good morning, Savannah. Joe. Well, yes, I would say yes. There's serious discussion and negotiations going on, led by Egypt, backed by the European Union and the United States. And the the Israeli government, different spokesmen have said that the the talks are underway. But there's certainly no no sign of a ceasefire right now. The firing is pretty heavy in both directions, although less, uh, it must be said, fewer rockets from Gaza into Israel than the last few nights. It could be that they're on their back foot because of the heavy shelling by Israel. Over the last few days, um, Hamas and Islamic Jihad had threatened to fire rockets at the Knesset, the Israeli parliament in Jerusalem, at the northern city of Haifa, at Tel Aviv. None of that happened. So it suggests that Israel's rockets are having an effect. 
But meanwhile, the discussions for a ceasefire um, are beginning to take place, beginning to become serious. Israel, a couple of days ago, said that they were beginning to get, feel pressure from the United States, but they said not heavy pressure. Now I believe that the pressure is growing considerably. Um, the fear that the fighting could spread is the reason, the real impetus for Israel to, and America to want it to stop as quickly as possible. And now, Martin, we actually saw Palestinians go on strike yesterday, shuttering stores and businesses, not just in the occupied West Bank, but across some Israeli towns as well. Tell us about the purpose of those. Are they getting violent? What happened there? Well, the, 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 this was a success for Hamas. They haven't had many successes in this, on, in this bout of fighting. But one success they've had is getting the Israeli Arabs um, to join with Palestinian Arabs to an extent in, in, um, in fighting the Israeli authorities. So we saw yesterday on the West Bank some really uh, widespread fighting uh, involving tear gas and rubber bullets between, between Israeli forces and uh, the West Bank Arabs. And the conflict inside Israel between Israeli Arabs and Israeli Jews is, 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 is also very severe and probably the, the thing that most worries, the most worries Israel, hostility between Israeli Jews and Israeli Arabs, Savannah. And I know that you just touched a little bit on hopefully seeing an end to this violence and getting closer to a ceasefire, but we know that France and others are working on a Security Council resolution calling for one. What do we know about that? Um, <laughs> I've got to tell you, not much, not much at the moment. There have been efforts to get a resolution the last few days. The United States has, has, has blocked that. But the, the discussion here is about, about the ceasefire is whether or not there will be one. And, and within the next 24 hours, the Israeli Security Cabinet is set to meet to discuss a ceasefire, and there's two possibilities that are being discussed. One, that by 6 o'clock tomorrow morning local time, there could be a ceasefire. That's just, that's just discussion. And the other, the other uh, um, point is that if there is no agreement between Israel and Hamas for a ceasefire, it's possible that there could be a unilateral ceasefire by Israel. In other words, Israel simply stops firing and hopes that Hamas will do the same. All right, Martin, thank you for the latest, and we will be checking in with you. Now to major progress in the coronavirus pandemic. New York State, of course, including New York City, where I am, which was once the nation's epicenter, is lifting most COVID restrictions today, including the state's mask mandate. But that's not the case in neighboring New Jersey. I spoke with Dr. Anthony Fauci yesterday about the confusion with these new rules. I live and work in New York. I'm, I'm at our headquarters here at 30 Rock right now. I, tomorrow, according to our state guidelines, could go indoors places without a mask on, and that's allowed, and I'm being told that that's safe. It only takes me 15, 20 minutes to get over to New Jersey, where tomorrow that still won't be allowed, which makes me wonder, am I either being reckless in New York or overly cautious in New Jersey? Which one of those things is it? What do you think about that? Well, I'm not going to pass judgment on one state over the other, but I just uh, sort of comment that that's one of the issues you have to face when you have the system of our own government. I mean, we have 50 states. We have a federal government. But as part of our federalist approach to the country's government, the states can do what they want to do. You know what the solution to this dilemma that you're creating is? Let's get as many people vaccinated as we possibly can and we would not be having this discussion right now. MSNBC anchor Yasmin Vesugian is in New York's Union Square and NBC News Now correspondent Dasha Burns is in Hoboken, New Jersey. As they know, really only about 20 minutes from each other, like I just said to Dr. Fauci there. And as he noted, where the restrictions are very different. So Yasmin, let's start with you. What is reopening in New York today? What's allowed? All of New York basically is open for business, Savannah. It's pretty surreal, to say the least, having uh, lived in New York my whole life, really, and experiencing this pandemic firsthand, as you did as well. Um, the mask mandate, I think, going back and in, going, in, going into effect in April of 2020 and now essentially being lifted uh, when the CDC and the FDA essentially announced that the mask mandate was going to be lifted uh, last week. Governor Cuomo at the time said, we're not going to do it here in this state, of course, because of you know, the high cases that we experienced back in the spring. But now they're lifting the mask mandate. You no longer have to wear masks in most places here in New York City. We're talking restaurants. We're talking salons. We're talking gyms. We're talking museums. We're talking theaters. 
I'm actually sitting at 17 in Broadway right now. This is an area in which um, a lot of folks are walking to the gym. Just two blocks behind me is a gym. It's called Equinox, right? I'm seeing a lot of people in shorts going up to the gym. And I've been asking them um, throughout the morning as we were waiting to come to you as to whether or not they're going to be wearing masks inside the gym this morning. And a lot of people are telling me, finally, today is day one that we can actually take these masks off and they feel really good about it. Others, though, are saying, I'm still apprehensive. I'm still worried. One guy walking by me and shouting at me, the virus is still here. I'm fully vaccinated, but I'm going to continue to wear this mask. By the way, I want to mention one more thing. A lot of weddings having had to been canceled over the last Mm -hmm. year or so, you can now have your wedding, 250 people uh, indoors, 500 people outdoors. So New York City, Savannah, really open for business today. That's a big like wedding a there. Yeah. <laughs> Dasha, you're just four miles away from Yasmin, expensive. but worlds apart when it comes to the restrictions. They're in Jersey. Yeah. If you're inside, vaccinated or not, you still have to wear a mask. Why did New Jersey decide not to follow the CDC guidance right now? Hey, Joe Savannah, good morning. This is yet another example of the long and winding and sometimes confusing path out of this pandemic. New Jersey, like its neighbor, New York, was an early epicenter of the virus and in fact has had the most deaths per capita of any state. But it is now just one of only four states not adopting this uh, CDC guidance. The governor saying that the goal is to make sure that dropping a mask mandate does not lead to a backslide in progress. And health officials here saying, look, the uh, daily death numbers are still in the double digits. The numbers of hospitalizations, though lower than they have been in months, are still double what they were last summer when there was no vaccine. And there's concern about variants in certain parts of the state that have lower vaccination rates. So the governor saying we're not quite out of the woods yet here, you guys. And Dasha, what's been the reaction to that decision in New Jersey, especially when people know just across the river they could have their mask off? Yeah, as you can imagine, it's been mixed and even like watching uh, folks walk by here. Some people uh, dropping those masks outside, others still keeping them on, although New Jersey did lift the outdoor mask mandate. But this is especially tough for businesses, the ones that have made it through this pandemic. They've had to make some pretty tough decisions and this announcement putting them through another round of those. Uh, The coffee shop just on the corner here has decided not to open its indoor space at all because of this announcement. And I want you to hear from just a couple business owners here in New Jersey. Take a listen. We should be following the guidance from the CDC. And why New York? Why Connecticut? They're open and we're not going to open? I don't understand that at all. Whatever happens there should happen here. So both governors or mayors, everybody's got to kind of fall in sync because the customers that I have coming from New York are coming to New Jersey from New Jersey to New York. It's the same. uh, We have to have the same thing both sides of the water. And guys, as you well know, there are a lot of businesses on the river here literally looking over to neighboring <laughs> yeah. New York that has a very different set of rules today. So a lot of confusion on the streets in New Jersey, guys. Absolutely. Yeah. And Yasmin, we should note 39 percent of New York City residents are now fully vaccinated. But that also means 60 yeah. percent of the city still not fully vaccinated. So what's the city doing to try and speed up vaccination so more people can ditch their masks? So if you're 16 and older, you can literally walk into any state-sponsored vaccine site and get a vaccine today. They're encouraging people to do that. Also, there's four pop-up vaccine sites. So literally, if you're traveling through Penn Station, for instance, or Grand Central, you can get a vaccine on your way out, and then you get a seven-day uh, Metro card. By the way, 24-hour Metro service uh, back in service as well. So that's interesting, um, to say the least. They're encouraging folks to get vaccinated. I mean, Savannah, in that interview um, with Dr. Anthony Fauci saying, listen, the solution here is to get as many folks vaccinated as possible. I was talking to a guy who walked right by me earlier today who didn't have a mask on. And I asked him, was he excited about this mask mandate being lifted? And he said, yes. And I said, are you vaccinated? And he said, no, I've had um, COVID before. And I said, well, what will encourage you to get vaccinated? He said, if my life is restricted, then I'm going to go ahead and get vaccinated. So it's really interesting to see um, kind of the different voices that we're hearing here in New York day one of this major reopening, guys. Yeah, absolutely. We also saw that slight spike in vaccinations in Ohio after the governor said you could win a million dollars if you get your shot. So we'll see how states go about trying to encourage people. (laughs) Dasha and Yasmin, thank you both so much. And as you heard just a few moments ago, I just got to speak with Dr. Anthony Fauci as these mask mandates lift across the country about the confusion there, the latest on kids and COVID and where we are in the fight against the pandemic. Here's more from that conversation. 
while we do have so many people unvaccinated, do you trust or, or do you trust that the system is to trust unvaccinated people to remain masked? When you go into an establishment that since we don't have vaccine passports, you don't know who is vaccinated and who is not. And importantly, you don't know if there's an infected person who comes into your establishment, being a restaurant, a bar, or what have you, and you don't know whether that person might be infecting someone else in your own establishment. For that reason, there are many establishments who are now saying, okay, it's fine that the CDC says that vaccinated people don't have to wear a mask either outdoors or indoors, but if you want to come into my establishment, I still maintain you have to wear a mask because I don't want to be responsible for the spread of infection in my establishment. And we're seeing that. I mean, people are doing that and it's understandable why they are doing that. Do you think we're at a point in our understanding of the virus that that it's really OK for people to feel confident if they have been vaccinated, that they are safe without a mask? Yeah, that's a great question. And what you're really asking is what is the data that made the CDC make that recommendation? And it really was over the last few weeks, an accumulation of data that showed first efficacy. The vaccines are even more effective in the real world setting than they were in the clinical trial. As effective, if not better. Number two, what we're seeing is that it even works against several of the variants. So we were concerned about variants. And even if you do get infected when you're vaccinated, first of all, it is very likely going to be an asymptomatic infection. And we know that the level of virus in your nasal pharynx, if you have a breakthrough infection, namely you're vaccinated, but you still get infected and without symptoms, it's extremely unlikely that you're gonna transmit the infection to anyone else. Those three things, unlikely transmission, highly effective, covers the variants. That's the reason why that recommendation and that guideline was made. And Dr. Fauci, what would you do without a mask? I know you've said that you're going on runs and such outside, but what about indoors? No, I would feel comfortable being indoors without a mask. I'm, I've been fully vaccinated now for a few months. I haven't, only because of the nature of the fact that I'm working 18 hours a day, I don't have much chance to go and socialize in restaurants and bars, but I wouldn't hesitate to do something indoors without a mask. Like grocery shop, go to a movie, you would be comfortable? Yeah, yeah, I would, I would. Now that we have the Pfizer vaccine available to those who are 12 and up, since that's really a decision that a lot of parents are going to have to make about whether or not to get them vaccinated, what would you say to parents who are on the fence about that? Well, I think that right now the the data are very clear that kids, adolescents from 12 to 15 years old, the vaccine is highly, highly effective and really quite safe. We're going to very likely be able to vaccinate all of these kids before the fall term which would be very good for high schools because that's an area because of the social interaction of kids at that age that they tend to spread the infection rather easily. Can kids play safely outside without their masks on? You know, the CDC still is, has as their recommendation that if you have kids outside, if they're with their own family and they're not mixing groups, mixing families, that they could be outside without a mask. But once you get the mix of a lot of different groups of kids together, the CDC recommendation is still that kids should have masks on under those circumstances. Why is that? What are the risks there? Is it kids getting COVID or what is the concern? The concern is kids getting infected from one from one another. For example, a child may be in a family but that is not vaccinated and there's infection being spread in that family, comes outside, plays with a child from another family, another household that could be spread. I mean, the CDC continues to reevaluate those recommendations, but currently that's where they are now with the recommendations. What would be the threshold for that changing for kids playing outside? Would it be them getting vaccinated? Well, certainly vaccination would solve it. If that were the case and they were vaccinated, there would be no need for any vaccinated person to wear a mask outdoors or indoors. But one of the things that could also contribute to that is if the level of infection in the community 
dramatically diminishes. What do you think, Dr. Fauci, in six months, a year from now, do you think life will feel some sense of normal? I know we're getting there, but really, will it feel that way? If we continue on the pathway of getting people vaccinated at the rate we're doing right now, I believe by the time we get into the summer, and certainly as we get into the fall and and late fall, I believe we're going to approach a a considerable degree of normality. It's not going to be perfectly normal, but it's going to be as close to normal. I think that would make people satisfied that they're feeling like things were the way they were before all this happened. Are you personally optimistic about where you see the case numbers at right now? Yeah, I'm quite I mean, I I never declare victory before we're there. I think that would be premature. But I'm feeling good about the way the numbers are going and the direction of the trend. In North Carolina, the deputies involved in the shooting death of Andrew Brown Jr. will not face any charges. Protesters took to the streets of Elizabeth City following yesterday's announcement by the district attorney who called the killing tragic but justified. NBC News correspondent Sam Brock joins us now from Elizabeth City. Sam, good morning. Joe, good morning. This is a city of fewer than 20,000 people, so you can only imagine the death of Andrew Brown rocked this community. And Joe, when asked how Brown Brown posed a threat to deputies, the district attorney said that he wielded his car as as a weapon and also said that he failed to follow commands. Mr. Brown's death, while tragic, was justified. Those words from District Attorney Andrew Womble, all but ensuring deputies involved in Andrew Brown's death will not face criminal charges. A decision immediately prompting protests in Elizabeth City and grief from residents who say they're overwhelmed by tragic outcomes. They do not have a right to kill our black men. After weeks of calls to release police body camera video of the incident, Mr. Womble revealing an edited 40-second sequence of clips from several different angles, showing a team of uniformed deputies surrounding Brown's car on April 21st from all sides, trying to serve him a search and arrest warrant for drugs. One deputy grabbing the door handle before he's jolted away as the car backs up and then accelerates forward. Then an opening shot fired through the front window, followed by a volley of bullets from the side and rear, one striking Brown in the back of the head, according to an autopsy report. The simple act of starting the car in violation of an officer's command puts the, makes the car a dangerous, deadly weapon that can be used at that point and officers can shoot. That explanation not sufficient for civil rights attorneys representing Brown's family. Why is it in America that it seems to be the most dangerous thing to police officers are black men running away from them. The family now asking the Justice Department to intervene. Overnight, demonstrators frustrated by the process and the outcome, some carrying signs, others blocking an intersection. Let's not make this an issue of black and white, because you see people of all different type of races and everything out here. This is not a black and white issue. This is a right and wrong issue. And what they did to Andrew Brown was wrong. Now, the sheriff here has filed another petition to release the body camera to the public. That does require, Joe, a sign-off from a judge. As for the three deputies who discharged their weapons, they have retained their jobs but are currently undergoing retraining. Joe, back to you. All right, Sam Brock, thank you so much. Let's now get a check on your morning news now weather and the latest on that flooding in the south that's turned deadly. Bill Karens is here with more on that. Bill, good morning. Yeah, unfortunately, guys, uh, it was just as bad as we thought it would be. Louisiana was hit the hardest, especially the Baton Rouge area. I mean, they just had a ton of water. They reported over 250 water rescues. I mean, that's people getting pulled out of cars, houses, apartment complex. There was a ton of water, some areas reporting as much as a foot of rain. And unfortunately, four fatalities in Louisiana was reported by the governor. I know we had one water fatality and a person in a vehicle that went into a ditch in Texas. So at least five fatalities and that number could grow. So here's what we're looking at. It's still raining in Louisiana, especially from Houston to Beaumont. As we go throughout the day today, we still have a flash flood watch for 28 million 
Saint people from Texas all the way through Lake Charles, Baton Rouge, and the New Orleans area. How much more rain are we going to get the rest of this week? An additional two to four inches, and especially coastal areas will be the worst, guys. Isolated up to eight inches. So for today, life-threatening flash flooding continues, unfortunately, in Texas and Louisiana. All right, All right. Thank you, Bill. Coming up, the House votes today on a commission looking into the January 6th attack on the Capitol. But there is opposition from top Republicans. We'll have all the details next. The House is set to vote today on a bill that would create a bipartisan commission to investigate the January 6th riot on Capitol Hill. The House GOP leadership is now urging members to vote against it, even though a top Republican was involved in negotiating the bill. Democrat Benny Thompson and Republican John Katko reached a compromise to model the bill after the 9-11 commission. NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Leanne Caldwell joins us now. So, Leanne, at one point it was thought some Republican House members might vote in favor of the commission. How is that looking now? Well, Joe, they actually still could, despite the fact that their leadership is urging them to vote against it. House Republican leader Kevin McCarthy came out very strongly against this legislation, despite deputizing a member of his party to negotiate with Democrats. In a statement yesterday, he said that he blamed Speaker Pelosi for prolonging the discussions over this, saying that she is putting politics over policy. And then last night on Fox News, he complained about the scope of the commission, that it's not broad enough. Take a listen. Remember on Good Friday, an officer was killed out of the Capitol. We don't need to investigate that. What about all the riots that have led up throughout the summer, the, the unrest from BLM, Antifa, and others? No, you can't investigate that. This is driven solely by politics and Nancy Pelosi, but we should not be a part of that. Despite GOP leaders' concerns, there are at least two dozen Republicans, even maybe more, who might break with him today and vote for it. Joe. So, Leanne, looking at the Senate, Majority Leader Chuck Schumer says he will put the bill to the floor for a vote. Assuming all 50 Democrats will support it, what are the chances of 10 Republican senators voting to pass the bill to get around the filibuster? Well, that's the big question, and it's too early to tell. Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell told reporters yesterday that Republicans are undecided. And my sources say that he is telling them to keep their powder dry for the time being, not come out for or against this legislation to see where it lands in the House and see what it looks like when it gets over to the Senate. So even though it's likely to pass the House today, the, the future is still unknown, of course, in the Senate, Joe. Like so many other things. Leanne Caldwell, yeah. thank you so much. Appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. Let's take a look at what's making news around the world this morning. NBC News foreign correspondent Claudio Lavanga joins us from Rome. Good morning, Claudio. Good morning, Savannah, and good morning, Joe. Well, in Colombia, protesters are expected to take the streets for the third week in a row in what started as a demonstration against the planned tax reform and has now become a widespread protest uh, against uh, the government and police accused of violence against demonstra demonstrators and uh, abuse against women. Uh, since the start of the protest at the end of April, uh, more than 50 demonstrators were killed, hundreds more were injured, and hundreds more uh, have disappeared. Now, elsewhere, in the world uh, with only 10 weeks to go to the Tokyo Games. A lot of Japanese seem to think this is not the right time to be hosting the Olympics. In the latest, in a recent uh, survey, uh, the 43% of Japanese respondents uh, said they want the Olympics cancelled. 40% want them postponed. Japan is uh, right now uh, trying to deal with a fourth wave of coronavirus and a lot of Japanese appear to think, at least according to the survey, that uh, to bring in hundreds of athletes and, of course, staff members for the Olympics would only make the situation worse. And last but not least, in China, one of the country's tallest skyscrapers had to be evacuated after it started wobbling out of the blue. Uh, well, now we've seen a lot of terrified pedestrians and onlookers, uh, scenes of panic. They were running for their lives uh, after the thousand foot tall tower in Shenzhen started to, uh, to shake from one side to the other for no apparent reason. Now, that's what I call, guys, a skyscraper that has been scraping the skies a little too much. <laughs> yeah, <That's> a, I'd <laughs> say so. <laughs> that's scary. Thank you, Claudio. <laughs> really scary. Thanks. Coming up, is it really possible to, quote, work yourself to death?
We've got some sobering new data for all you workaholics next. Singer Demi Lovato took to Twitter early this morning with a video announcement to fans. Over the past year and a half, I've been doing some healing and self-reflective work. And through this work, I've had the revelation that I identify as non-binary. With that said, I'll officially be changing my pronouns to they, them. The singer went on to say that they are still learning about themselves and they hope by coming out, others will feel more comfortable sharing who they are. And Savannah, I believe Demi has a podcast with a new episode coming out today. They plan to talk about this even more. Oh, yeah, I'm sure there'll be a lot in there. All right. Thanks, Joe. It's time now for our weekly checkup, where we discuss the latest health headlines you may have missed, a.k.a. non-COVID headlines. NBC News senior medical correspondent Dr. John Torres joins us now. Good morning, Dr. Torres. I love this segment. I think it's really important to make sure people know other health news that could ultimately save lives, like this first one I want to ask you about, lowering the age of colon cancer screening from 50 to 45. What's behind that change? And you're right, Savannah, I think most people are sitting there going, wait a minute, there's non-COVID yeah. health news out there, but there is, and they'll continue to be. So we want to cover some of that. And this first one is about lowering that age of colon cancer screening. As most people know, it's been the age 50, which has been the time period where they said, you need to start screening for colon cancer. Well, now they're saying that 45 is the new 50. This is a government entity that makes the guidelines. 45 is the age they say you need to start taking that cancer screening seriously and start doing it. Number one reason, because colon Rectal cancer is the number three cancer killer in the U.S. And now we have found out that that 45 to 50 year old age group has a higher risk. Their risk is the same as that 50 to 60 year old age group. And so that risk seems to be lowering by the decade. And we want to make sure we capture those early because when you get colon cancer screened early, it's more likely to be a successful screening, successful treatment. Also, because the USPSTF, this is the entity that now lowered it to 45, insurance will now cover those screenings starting at the age of 45. So what are your doctor's orders? Well, first and foremost, number one, you want to talk to your doctor about getting screening once you start, once you get to the age of 45. There's a variety of tests you can use out there. There's stool-based tests and colonoscopy, but colonoscopy is the most recommended. If you're at higher risk, even under the age of 85, meaning you have a family history, particularly if you're African-American, then talk to your doctor if you are in those categories because you might need to start earlier and that's something Mm. you need to work on sooner rather than later, Savannah. Yeah, absolutely. Dr. Torres, I've got one for you here. A study that shows secondhand smoke can harm a fetus. What more can you tell us about that? And Joe, you're right. And this is a study I think is taking a couple of people by surprise. We know that secondhand smoke can affect us almost as much as firsthand smoke. Firsthand smoke is me smoking. Secondhand smoke would be somebody in the room if I'm smoking. But what we found out is children, the developing fetus can be affected by secondhand smoke as well. And particularly, they can be affected to the point of having decreased lung function by the time they turn age six. And this is seen even with minimal amounts of that type of smoke exposure. So what are the doctors? orders here. Well, the doctor's orders are fairly simple. Avoid people that smoke around you. You want to make sure that you aren't near anybody smoking, even somebody in the house that casually smokes because they found out even minimal amounts of exposure can cause an issue. And then, of course, the biggest one, don't smoke, not just for the fetus, but for you as well. One of those big things you want to quit, Joe. Wow, that's a scary one. All right. This other one that we teased, I'm sure people were wondering about. There might be some truth in the phrase, Working to death, a study suggested long hours could lead to an increased risk of heart disease and stroke. I'm sure a lot of people have been having trouble separating work from home life during this year. So tell us what we need to know here. Especially during the pandemic, Savannah, you're right. We've been increasing our work hours because we live in our office, basically. And this is the first global analysis. The World Health Organization did it, looking at how much work affects your health and particularly affects stroke and heart attack risks. And they found out that 35% higher risk of having a stroke, 17% higher risk of having a heart attack if you work 55 or more hours, particularly if you start doing that in your middle age years, even down to the age of 45 and above, working those hours can really increase your 
your risk of having, again, a heart attack or smoke so or stroke. So what can you do with that? Well, first and foremost, acknowledge the fact that if you do work more than 55 hours, you want to try and share the workload as best you can with fellow employees, if that's possible. But also, if it's not possible, realize that you're at a higher risk of heart attack or stroke. So do the other things you can do to mitigate that. Eat healthy, exercise, get better sleep. Of course, stop smoking. These things can help counterbalance it. And then talk to your employer if you can and agree on a maximum number of working hours with employers. Mm. Uh, and, you know, there's a saying I've always heard that I always went by earlier in my life. And uh, somebody once told me that, you know, on a person's deathbed, they never once mm. said, I wish I had worked more. And so wow. remember that because you want to work as least as you can, but still do, you know, the things you need to do. But at the same time, watch your health. Dr. Torres, the doctor's order is getting deep today. That was a good one. Thank you, <laughs> you so go. much. Really important information there, doctor. We'll see you soon. And we will be right back with NBC's Lester Holtz reporting across America. Louisville Metro Police were thrust into the national spotlight after the death of Breonna Taylor. Now their new chief is hoping to chart a new path, even as they are dealing with a Justice Department investigation. Here's NBC Nightly News anchor Lester Holt. And Joe, police use of force against black people has come under sharp scrutiny in so many American cities. Here in Louisville, the police shooting death of Breonna Taylor last year amplified demands for change. We wanted to understand what change here could look like. Louisville is a city desperately in search of a way to heal. A new chief determined to embrace and lead change in a broken police department. Do you think there's a connection between policing and racism? Oh, I know there is. I mean, I employ human beings. They come to the table, they develop inherent biases. Um, data supports that all day long. Now, I think it's important to distinguish that that's not saying police are racist. I think that what happens is we focus on the end result and not the process. A grieving mother determined not to allow her daughter's death at the hands of police go unpunished. I want these officers to be charged for her murder because that's exactly what it was. As the nation was shutting down from COVID 14 months ago, what happened here in March 2020 stopped Louisville in its tracks. The shooting death of Breonna Taylor, an innocent 26-year-old woman gunned down by police in her own home as they executed a no-knock warrant. It happened after Taylor's boyfriend fired first, thinking they were intruders. The tragedy exposing a festering wound in this city. Today, it's police department under a Justice Department investigation focused on whether Louisville Metro Police have engaged in systematic and unlawful behavior. It will also assess whether LMPD engages in discriminatory conduct on the basis of race. Under not just the spotlight of Louisville, but the entire nation, Erica Shields was hired to lead Louisville police in January. Her hiring controversial due to the police-involved shooting of Richard Brooks in Atlanta, where she served as police chief and resigned. Shields is a self-described reformer who welcomes the federal investigation. So they've come to look at patterns and practices. I think that's fantastic. That being said, it's really important to me that that when they conclude their report in six or nine months, we have things on track and, and can stand behind the work that we're doing. But some say the tension and distrust has long existed, fueled by decades of racism and segregation. This is the Ninth Street Divide. There's no signage marking it, but it's known to local residents as a physical and economic separation of West Louisville, a mostly black community, from the rest of the city, a symbolic racial divide. In Louisville, black residents represent 21% of the population, but were involved in around 50% of the police use of force incidents. It appears you're going to have to reconcile the Breonna Taylor death. The justice system declined to prosecute anyone directly in her killing. How do you move past that? Breonna Taylor's death is, is sickening. I sincerely hope that the FBI in their investigation might close some of the gap here. I have very real concerns about how the warrant was drawn up um, because I do think it's a miscarriage of justice if you can be in your residence shot and killed by law enforcement and no one is no one's held accountable for it. 
Tamika Palmer, Breonna Taylor's mom, is still fighting for accountability. None of the three officers involved was charged in Taylor's death. The only indictment for shots that went into a neighbor's wall. At the Speed Art Museum, Promise, Witness, Remembrance reflects on the life of Taylor and the movement that followed. Palmer helped create the exhibit. What do you love about this portrait? Everything. Do you hope that maybe in some way Brianna's death and, and police reforms here could be a model? Definitely. I think that the way that this thing has played out in front of the world, people will definitely have to use this situation to make things better everywhere. Chief Shields is paving a path forward. This police department has an extremely strong culture and positive culture. There are multiple practices that are broken. There are good people here. We have absolutely room for improvement. We have to do things differently. I'm going to get them there. And coming up, a wildly popular mega church attracting young people from across the globe, celebrities and waves of scandal. Now its founder is breaking his silence on controversies of the past. That's next. They're known for church services that look more like concerts with celebrity attendees like Justin Bieber and Vanessa Hudgens. But Hillsong Church has gone through a leadership crisis this year. Now for the first time, Hillsong founder and senior global pastor Brian Houston is speaking publicly about the failures within the church and his pledge to make it right. Today, anchor Savannah Guthrie spoke to him exclusively. Music empire, along with highly produced podcasts and a TV channel. You're still a carrier of God's spirit. Charismatic, young and fashionable leaders and celebrity attendees from Justin Bieber to Vanessa Hudgens to Chris Pratt. Not what you might expect from church on a Sunday, but it's why Hillsong has grown into one of the most influential mega churches in the world and one of the most controversial. You know who's going to give you peace? It's going to be the expert. His name is Jesus. Its popularity exploded in the U.S. with the high profile of the, quote, celebrity pastor, Carl Lenz, whose recent downfall has triggered a wave of scandals for the church Brian Houston created in Australia more than 30 years ago. What has this season in the church been like for you? I think it's been difficult, clearly, because of a lot of disappointment in some of the things that have emerged. Get your mind right. There's hope for you yet. Lentz founded the East Coast branch of Hillsong in 2010, drawing stars in like Justin Bieber, who Lentz baptized in an NBA player's bathtub. But it all came crashing down last fall when Lentz was fired and admitted to an affair. Writing on social media, I am deeply sorry for breaking the trust of many people. A woman who says she was his mistress speaking soon after. He keeps saying, um, I manage celebrities and I travel with them. He didn't want to say what he does. And more allegations of unusual behavior for a pastor followed. People described Carl Lentz as somewhat aloof and removed from the actual ministry. They say he would come in a chauffeured car, wait in a green room, come do a sermon and depart. Does that bother you? It does to a degree, for sure. Look, Carl is Carl. He's a unique character. There's a lot of things I miss about Carl. And by having said that, there were leadership issues that I believe included lying, included what I would call narcissistic behavior. Should you have known earlier? Should you have done something earlier? about the leadership of Hillsong? I think there's a lot of things I should have known earlier. And hopefully moving forward, we'll make sure we have far better systems in place and better accountability. You see this pastor with the VIP row palling around celebrities. How come he didn't come down harder and say, not in my church, no way. How does this reflect the message I'm trying to preach? There's another side to it. I mean, one person who's obviously been well reported is Justin Bieber. If you think back, several years now when he was wrecking hotel rooms and basically on the edge of getting deported to Canada there was certainly talk about that and living an out of control life uh, with abuse of, of uh, drugs and so on and look at Justin Bieber today, anyone 
who's being fair could see a radical change. And so not everything about it is bad. No, I guess the question is whether the celebrities got better treatment, more attention. I, I do think that we d did allow a culture to develop where it was one rule for celebrities and a different rule for other people. I'll give you the cynical view that as long as Carl was attracting press, bringing more members into Hillsong, that you were okay with that. You, you knew what was going on, but you were okay with that. What do you say to those who believe that? I find it annoying that people thought that it was important to me and my wife Bobby uh, to attract famous people to church. Let me ask you to respond to one idea that has been out in the press a lot. One former staffer said Carl was a mini you, a mini Brian Houston. What do you say? I mean, on one level, if people say Carl was like me, I'd see it as a compliment because incredibly gifted guy. But on another level, I don't think Carl really is anything like me. What about the notion of you as the head of the church and the pastor of the church, but being a rarefied presence and waiting in the green room before the sermon or not really being terribly approachable? Does any of that ring true to you? Um, well, to a degree, yes, but I'll, I'll give perspective to it. Mostly before you speak, you, you, you're preparing and you've got to keep your heart right and you don't want distractions. I am ultimately responsible. I am ultimately accountable. The firing of Lentz in New York opened the floodgates for Hillsong. In the months that followed, a senior staffer in New Jersey resigned over what a church spokesperson says was an inappropriate message on social media. Hillsong announced its pastors in Dallas resigned. The church there closed. A letter to New York leadership in 2018 surfaced, alleging abusive behavior by church leaders. Other former congregants from Australia to the U.S. told today some volunteers were overworked. In my mind, if one person is treated badly, that's one too many. If it's true that people have been treated badly or that people have been bullied, I am 100% committed to moving that out of our church. Yeah. Does it make you look inward and say, whoa, I'm a pastor. What happened here? I have reflected many, many times. and I'm acknowledging uh, that mistakes have been made and that there are things where we need to get far better, much better. Uh, I'm not shrinking back from that. Have you thought about Maybe this church is too big, the problems reflect that, then it's time to, to downsize or take a different approach. Yeah, I'm not sure a church can be too big. I just think we have to grow into ourselves. And God's on your side. But Beyond the scandals, Hillsong is facing the cultural tensions of a rapidly expanding evangelical Christian church in a society where norms are changing quickly. Gay members of Hillsong have had difficult experiences, some who have said they've even felt suicidal after their experiences. Why do you think that has happened? Look, I want us to get better at uh, the way we communicate and embrace and work with people who are gay. I don't have any personal bias at all against gay or lesbian people, but unfortunately as a pastor you don't represent what you think, you represent what the Bible says. And so at this point, we still are conservative on, on the subject of active gay relationship, etc. But it's a journey. But everyone's welcome. Many, many people who are gay come to Hillsong Church. Now, for the church itself, it's a season of finding redemption. Churches can come in all kinds of sizes and shapes and flavors, but you see the lights, you see the music, you do see the pretty people. Do you ever think about what Jesus would have felt like sitting in Hillsong Church? Your honest answer? Yes. I think he would like it. Because I think we're focusing on glorifying him. I spoke to quite a few parishioners. What is your message to those who love this church and are heartbroken about what's happened? Those are the things that keep me awake at night. I think larger churches everywhere are needing to scramble to put the things in place for a 21st century mindset that'll enable us to be stronger.
But, Savannah, I look in you, I tell you, I genuinely believe in my heart Hillsong is a good church. Hey, NBC News viewers, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights, and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.